Unlike other European powers that started to acquire territory during the heyday of imperialism in the 19th century, Russia already had been an empire for centuries by that time, and a Eurasian empire at that. Its territory stretched across 11 time zones and contained extraordinary natural wealth. Its immense territorial breadth also yielded human capital of great diversity. The unique interests of Russia's many ethnic and religious groups frequently interjected tension between the centralized state on the one hand and the non-Russian Orthodox periphery on the other. And this often engendered repressive policies to safeguard the empire. Some groups fell into line, while others resisted. Further, until modern times, Russia lacked the requisite technology to effectively extract, transport, and monetize its rich supply of natural resources, from fossil fuels and mineral deposits to seemingly endless stocks of timber. Ultimately, while the Russian component of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics held the upper hand, non-Russian republics won at least nominal independence through the late 20th century dissolution of the Soviet Union itself. When Western Europeans thought of Russia around the time of the Italian Renaissance, if they did so at all, it was without much concern, without much interest or apprehension. Russia was a distant, innocuous, largely isolated state on the far eastern periphery of Europe. Its 13th century conquest by the Mongols tremendously set back the Slavic country although only a few decades earlier, in the 11th and 12th centuries, the Kievan Rus, as Russia was then known, had a rich culture and diplomatic and trading networks that had warranted Europe's attention. After the Mongols' invasion, imperial and political fortunes began to fade. Tsar Ivan III announced the end of Russian subordination in 1480, and he formalized a trend that had been underway since the start of his reign in 1462. Known as Ivan the Great, he centralized his control as Tsar and the position of Moscow among Russian principalities. Ivan was also known as the Great Gatherer of Lands. He subdued his neighbors and annexed their territory. He reestablished diplomatic relations with foreign states and he built the Kremlin as an architectural manifestation of Russian power. This took shape on the heels of the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. The Byzantine Empire, as heir to the great Christian Empire of Rome, had been vanquished by an Islamic power, and Ivan now sought to promote Moscow in Constantinople's place. Ivan, along with his son Vasily, and grandson Ivan IV, conceived of and presented Muscovite Russia as the only independent Orthodox realm in the world. It was the Third Rome, destined, in the words of the historian Marshall Poe, to unite all Christian realms under its sway. Think about this enormous transition in fortunes for a moment. When Ivan III had come to power, his realm extended only a few hundred miles out from Moscow in any direction. Many areas that had been part of Kiev and Rus's political orbit, including Kiev, Novgorod, and Tver, lay beyond his control. And though Kiev would remain outside of Moscow's jurisdiction for some time yet, until the mid-17th century, Ivan annexed Novgorod and Tver in short order. Ivan's grandson, Ivan IV, known to history as Ivan the Terrible, claimed the title of Tsar from the moment of his coronation in 1547, when he was just 17 years old. The historian, Marshall Poe, tells us that the young Tsar swiftly claimed dynastic as well as religious superiority over all other European monarchs. A sense of Christian messianism, tinged with the belief in his own destiny, guided this, this Ivan's foreign endeavors. He undertook to push out the borders of his territory and in the process, transformed the state of Muscovy into the first true Russian empire. 
This began with his conquest of the Tatar Khanates of Kazan and Astrakhan in 1552 and 1556, respectively. These victories were pivotal in the development of Russia's Eurasian landmass. Incorporating Kazan and Astrakhan extended the state along the southern Volga down to the Caspian Sea. The Caspian was landlocked, but control of the Volga and in time access to the Caspian waterway allowed for the expansion of Russia trade, wealth, and power. Ivan ordered the construction of St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square to commemorate this victory over the Muslim Khans. For Ivan and many of his contemporaries, Russia's conquest of Kazan and Astrakhan, whose inhabitants were primarily Muslim, confirmed the supremacy of the Russian Orthodox state over its Muslim neighbors, according to Loyola University Chicago historian Mikhail Khodorovsky. Having Muslim subjects within Russian territory also created a sense of otherness within Ivan's realm. Non-Orthodox subjects in its dominions made it necessary to define what it meant to be Russian for the first time. Diversity prompted self-awareness, and adherence to the Russian Orthodox Church and religion began to signal Russianness. In other words, religion became part of the criteria for inclusion, because to be Russian was to be Russian Orthodox. To help spread Russianness and loyalty to the state and czar, the colonial administration encouraged conversion. And when initial efforts to compel conversion proved counterproductive, Russian officials took a more conciliatory tactic. Indeed, conversion for non-Russian nobles soon brought fast-track assimilation and privilege within the czarist feudal structure. The Russian state enlisted local elites as loyal emissaries of Moscow's power. And even lower-class converts received perquisites like exemptions from taxes or military service. In contrast, converts who clung to Islamic practices and violated church tenets were imprisoned and kept in chains until they more sincerely abandoned their Islamic faith. The disarray in the Mongol Empire left a great power vacuum in the broad expanses of Siberia and Central Asia, and the Russians capitalized on this. As an example, the Stroganovs were a wealthy merchant family who had settled in the mineral-rich northern region more than 1,000 kilometers from Moscow. Having amassed a fortune through trade and salt mining, the Stroganovs solicited the Tsar's favor by funding expeditions into Siberia. They even proposed to move across the Ural Mountains into a vast expanse of largely undeveloped lands that had constituted the territory of the Golden Horde at the westernmost edges of the Mongol Empire. 16th century technology was too primitive to extract much of the mineral wealth that lay in these domains, but one resource that could be obtained fairly easily was fur. The coniferous forested regions of the Siberian taiga served as home to an astounding array of animals whose pelts fetched great prices on international markets. Mink, sable, ermine, otter, and fox became known as soft gold, and this valuable commodity attracted many Russian trappers. The Stroganovs hired detachments of men to move into these sparsely inhabited lands and to subdue indigenous resistance in order to claim the territory for Russia. The Stroganovs built towns and then forts and hired mercenaries, many of them Cossacks, to defend the settlements from raids by the area's nomadic tribes. And they compelled locals to pay the Yasak, or fur tax. With this began the Russian colonization of Siberia. The University of Cincinnati historian, William Sunderland, describes the Cossacks during this period as the ultimate people on the edge. They were mixed bands made up of nomads and peasant runaways who settled in grassland enclaves in the southern sections of Russia. 
Although Cossacks were mainly Orthodox, their culture reflected a blend of Slavic and Turkic influences. Above all, the trait that sets the Cossacks apart was their independence. They lived beyond the formal reach of the Muscovite state, Sutherland says, and so they enjoyed a freedom of movement that other peasants and townsmen in Russia typically didn't. Several Cossack figures have become mythologized as popular heroes down through Russian history. One of the first was a man named Ermak, who took part in the conquest of Siberia. The mythology around this little-known personage became an important part of Russian cultural history. Accounts describe Ermak as leading the Cossacks into the Siberians' arrows while crying, God is with us. His forces carried the day on the Irtush River, and he captured the Khanate capital. But he died two years later in the same river while fleeing from an ambush. Between Ermak's conquest and the mid-17th century, Russia occupied most of Siberia and Central Asia. In 1648, the eastern expanse of the empire reached the Pacific Ocean. It had now added 4.5 million square miles to Russia's dominions. And although much of this territory was sparsely populated, it wasn't uninhabited. Scattered tribes occasionally resisted Russian forces, though without much success. Cossack troops rolled over native defenses, though. The geographical impediments to Russian expansion were slight. Unlike the oceans that separate most continents, the continental divide between Europe and Asia was less pronounced. Where Europe ended and Asia started would have been unclear to Ermak, as well as to his fellow Siberian conquistadors, and to most people in the 16th and 17th centuries. Further, Siberian rivers allowed for the relatively easy movement of people and goods in the East. So the transition, between continents in Eurasia was more cultural than physical. And more than race, religion constituted the continental divide. The Russians were Orthodox Christians and the heirs to Rome and Byzantium, whereas the Asians were Muslim, Buddhist, and shamanic. After reaching the edge of the Pacific, Russian attention turned to the South. Peter the Great focused on the Don River and the Sea of Azov a century after Ivan the Terrible had followed the Volga River to the Caspian Sea. In 1696, Peter secured a key victory over the Ottomans by the Sea of Azov. The Black Sea lay just behind. So this victory was important to Peter's quest to secure warm water ports and access to the Black Sea and the Straits of Constantinople. But not until the reign of Catherine the Great, at the end of the 18th century, would Russia be able to claim dominance in the Black Sea region. Still, Peter's accomplishments were great indeed. With a revamped army and a newly created navy, Peter expanded Russia in every direction. After a 21-year war with Sweden, in 1721, Peter declared his country to be an empire. In doing so, he claimed strategic parity with the other great European powers. Throughout his reign, Peter was determined to westernize his country and expunge what he saw as its backward elements. He sought to make Russia more developed and cultured. In other words, more European. Consequently, a cultural hierarchy developed that slid downward from West and Europe to East toward Asia. Peter's determination to emulate European culture increased its value in Russian life. At the same time, non-European elements suffered diminished prestige, ideas, traditions, styles, and norms that diverged from European standards became considered substandard. Russian elites viewed Asian culture as inferior. The question was, where did Europe stop and Asia begin? 
The Don River had traditionally demarcated this space. But as the Russian Empire expanded thousands of miles to the east, the balance seemed to tilt too far toward Asia. So Vasily Tatishev, a geographer, ethnographer, and historian, and one of Peter the Great's chief ideologues, shifted this internal marker to the Ural mountain chain. With this cartographical revision, Russia acquired a concrete topographical border that divided the country into discrete European and Asiatic parts. The Urals, with a peak elevation of 6,217 feet, or 1,895 meters, are far from the most formidable range in the world. But in the eyes of 18th century Russians, the Urals were built up into a vast mountain range, as if shaped by God on the middle of the steppe to mark the eastern limit of the civilized world. At least that's what the historian Orlando Fijus writes. He continues, the Russians on the western side of these mountains were Christians in their ways, whereas the Asians on the eastern side were described by Russian travelers as savages who needed to be tamed. Russian explorers, or more precisely, navigators and explorers in Russia's employ, continued to press the limits of the empire. Vitas Bering, a Danish navigator hired by the Russians, spotted the Alaskan coastline across a body of water in the far northeastern quadrant of Siberia in 1741. And it wasn't long before tiny Russian settlements arose in what's today Alaska. Catherine the Great sponsored additional Orthodox missions to Russian Alaska in the late 18th century to promote Russian influence on the other side of the Bering Sea. She hoped to use religion to colonize the distant wilderness for Russia. The distance traversed was too, far, too great and the number of Russian settlers too few for Catherine's plan to be effective. Catherine the Great also pushed the empire's boundaries further west through the Polish partitions of 1772, 1793, and 1795. And Russia gained more of the territory after the Napoleonic Wars of 1803 to 1815. It also seized Finland from Sweden in 1809. Catherine also expanded southward after the Russo-Turkish War of the 1770s and a rout of the Ottoman Turks. This new territory became known as New Russia, or Novorossiya, and by 1783, Catherine had annexed Crimea, adding a substantial new population of Islamic subjects to her realm and gaining full use of the critical Black Sea. Catherine and other Russian rulers after her also sought to conquer the Caucasus between the Black and Caspian Seas. The Russians annexed Georgia in 1801 and gained territory south to Azerbaijan and the eastern part of Armenia. Tsar Alexander I, who ruled from 1801 to 1825, after defeating Napoleon, turned his full attention to the Caucasus. But when the Russians tried to recruit native Islamic chiefs with financial rewards and land, as they had to colonize so much of Eurasia, they found little interest in few takers. Instead, Local tribes responded with guerrilla warfare, quick, limited, but deadly strikes against a better armed, more conventional military foe. The Russian general, Alexei Ermolov, was the man initially charged with subduing the resistance. To be sure, his assignment was a tough one. Local loyalties were strong. There was no tradition of centralized authority that the Russians could co-opt. So, Ermolov's solution was to pacify the region through violence. In a letter to Tsar Alexander I, he is said to have argued that the terror of his name would effectively guard the imperial frontier. Ermolov massacred opposing fighters and burned villages to the ground. Further, the Russians seized the wives and children of Chechen and Dagestani fighters and any unfortunate locals they found hostage. But 
the destruction and punishment of entire settlements and communities were turning more villagers into rebels, armed with the new ideology of resistance, Sufi Islam. Loyola historian Michael Khodorkovsky explains, as a result, the battle between the Russians and the people of the Caucasus raged for decades. Tens of thousands of people lost their lives in the conflict. By 1864, the Russians had pacified the region. Still, ethnic and religious tensions percolated, and in the 1990s, resentments erupted in a new wave of violence. Nevertheless, the extreme difficulty that Russia experienced in its 19th century explorations and adventures enhanced the Caucasus' reputation as a dangerous, exotic region on the edge, or perhaps just over the edge, of civilization. And Ermolov's fierce tactics aroused more admiration than opprobrium among many Russians. Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs Alexander Gorchakov writing in 1864 about the country's mission in Central Asia, noted that Russia's position in Central Asia was analogous to that of all civilized states confronting half-savage nomad populations. Gorchakov argued that Asians respected only force, and the only way to maintain order was to reduce them to a state of submission. Still, one of the most balanced, even sympathetic, accounts that we have of the people of the Caucasus comes from the pen of a Russian cadet who served in the Caucasus and in the Crimean War of the mid-19th century. In the novella, The Cossacks, Lev Tolstoy wrote, writes about a man named Olyanin, who seeks salvation from debts and the banality of aristocratic life through an adventure in the Caucasus. On Olyanin's journey south, Tolstoy writes that, along with visions of Circassian women, that is, women of the Caucasus renowned for their exotic beauty, his hero's dreams mingled with pictures of mountains, precipices, terrible torrents, and perils. The allure of the frontier in its remoteness and danger was intoxicating to Olyanin and for Tolstoy's readers. Tolstoy writes that upon Olyanin's arrival, his character felt freer every day. And as his sense of freedom grew, so did his feelings of manliness. For Olyanin, the magnetism of the Caucasus came as much from its people as its landscape. The native mountain people appeared to him beautiful, strong, and free. And the sight of them made him feel ashamed and sorry for himself. John Bailey, the late Wharton professor of English at Oxford University, says that Tolstoy was conveying the old romantic European dream of the noble savage, of participating in the life of a primitive and unspoiled community. However, in Tolstoy's final novella, Hajid Marad, the author challenges Russia's presence and actions in the Caucasus. His title character is a Tatar chieftain whom he presents as trying to make a deal with the Russians to rescue his family, who are held by a rival Caucasian leader. The chieftain, Hajid Murad, is depicted as a natural hero, uncorrupted by the banality and insincerity of European niceties or by Russian aristocratic civility. His heroism lays in his integrity and loyalty as much as it does in his courage as the Tatar interacts with the series of Russians who are there to colonize and subdue the region for the Tsar, the Russian civilizing mission comes across as nothing more than hypocritical cover for an endeavor predicated on power. Some Russians may have sympathized with Tolstoy's celebration of natural virtue, but in the 19th century, few would have willingly identified a non-Christian as embodying virtue or morality. Most saw the emperor's empire's Muslim subjects not as noble savages, but rather as ignoble savages in need of conversion 
and Christian civilization. Even so, by the end of the 19th century, fewer than half of the Tsar's subjects were ethnic Russians. And the fierce resistance leveled by the mountaineers of the Caucasus came to demonstrate the danger of diversity. So did regular uprisings on the parts of the Poles and Ukrainians. Indeed, with the unification of Germany in 1870 and the changing balance of power and diplomatic arrangements across Europe, national, religious, and cultural differences seem more dangerous than ever. Only a few decades earlier, Nicholas I, who ruled from 1825 until 1855, has said that he looked forward to the day when all the people within his territory would speak Russian, act Russian, and feel Russian. To achieve this, Nicholas instituted the policy of official nationality, which revolved around the premise that Christian orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality constituted the essence of the Russian Empire. To be Russian in an empire of rising nationalist sentiment across Europe, one had to be orthodox and loyal to the Romanov leader. But what about nationality? While the official nationality policy privileged ethnic Russians, what did this mean for the other half of the empire's population that was not ethnically Russian? Unlike other overseas colonial powers, where intermarriage was denounced, in the Russian Empire, intermarriage, especially in border regions, was encouraged, according to the University of Virginia historian Robert Garacci, at least so long as all non-Christian spouses converted to orthodoxy and Russian culture became dominant in the household. Beyond this, the Romanovs didn't waste much time on their less populous ethnic minorities. Their cultural prejudices already deemed Asian cultures as less developed and so less threatening. But in the European areas of the realm, the situation was different and potentially more challenging to the imperial order. For instance, after an uprising of Poles seeking independence from the Tsarist Empire, Nicholas I responded by eliminating many autonomous institutions in the Polish areas and placing restrictions on their schools as well as pressure on the Catholic Church. Ukrainians fared no better. Ukrainian pop publications were suppressed and the Russians sought to minimize the cultural differences between Ukraine and Russia. The Ukrainian language was billed as merely a dialect of Russian and even the name Ukrainian was shunned. Instead, Ukraine became officially known as Little Russia and its peoples were Little Russians. Russia's last two czars, Alexander III, who ruled from 1881 until 1894, and Nicholas II, who ruled from 1894 until 1917, were particular exponents of a 19th century policy to maintain control in the empire's European areas by trying to make the people more Russian. This policy is known as Russification. Enacted primarily through education and limitations on non-Russian literature and culture, especially in the Western border regions, Russification was supposed to bring the people of the empire closer together. It was a policy of cultural homogenization. The one constituency that the czars considered impossible to Russify were the empire's Jewish subjects. Jewish culture seemed too formidable to co-opt with a strong religious, cultural, and linguistic identity that extended further back into history than any Slavic counterpart. So the answer naturally was to isolate and repress it. Earlier, Catherine the Great's Polish partitions had brought a significant number of Jews into the empire. Soon after, Moscow merchants petitioned the empress to enact some legislation to protect their businesses from Jewish competition. Catherine complied and restricted Jewish merchants' activities to the regions annexed through the partitions. Over the next few decades, legislation limited Jewish residents to these areas. This region became known as the Pale of Settlement. 
The Pale comprised 15 Russian provinces in the western and southwestern regions of the empire. There, minor restrictions on Russia's Jews intensified to rabid discrimination and persecution at the end of the 19th century. Quotas limited the number of Jewish youth who could enroll in schools, and a host of professions were off limits to Jews. Up to 5 million Jews lived in the Pale, where they suffered economic and political repression. Alexander III and Nicholas II were both rabid anti-Semites. And now, as each man sought to repress revolutionary sentiment, they incited popular animosity toward the Jews to divert rising socioeconomic tensions away from the state. This resulted in violent attacks against Jews called pogroms. Even when Tsarist officials didn't directly foment these attacks, they passively stood by as Jewish property was destroyed and Jewish subjects were beaten, raped, and murdered. As at so many other times and places in history, Jews became the official scapegoats during a period of political, social, and economic uncertainty. Until the bitter end, the Romanovs maintained the Eurasian Empire that Ivan the Terrible had bequeathed to them centuries earlier. Convinced of their religious and cultural superiority, the Russian emperors and empresses closely managed nationalist sentiment and the occasional upheaval. But when revolution finally erupted in 1917, the ultimate ineffectiveness of, the, of Russification, the official nationality policy, and the Third Rome theory all became quite clear. <laughs>